You're listening to The Diplomats Podcast on Asian geopolitics. As always, I'm your host, Ankit Panda, recording from Washington, D.C. And I'm your co-host, Katie Putz, recording from Chicago. Hey, Katie, how are you doing today? Doing great. It's a lovely day out here in Windy City. Yeah, it's uh, it's good to be back. Uh, I apologize to listeners for the extended break uh, since our last episode. Uh, I unfortunately, well, unfortunately, but fortunately, uh, I, I am traveling more again. So I spent the last week uh, in South Korea. Uh, which was certainly uh, interesting for a variety of reasons, uh, not least because I was there uh, right after um, the shocking news about former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's assassination, which is what we'll be devoting uh, today's episode to, uh, not the assassination per se, but reflecting a little bit more broadly on Abe's legacy. Uh, I think it's fair to say that if we think about the last 10 years, uh, you know, I've been doing this podcast for now eight and a half years at The Diplomat, uh, and I think it would be fair to say that uh, during that eight and a half year period, uh, if I had to sort of pick five people that were really instrumental to shaping the geopolitical environment in the Indo-Pacific, I think Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe would certainly be uh, near the top of that list, uh, if not at the top of that list. Uh, so his assassination was certainly unexpected and tragic. Uh, he was assassinated while delivering a stump speech ahead of Japan's upper house elections in Nara. Um, he was uh, killed by an attacker who had motives that do not appear to be related to Abe's uh, domestic political or international positions per se, uh, sort of um, more inside conspiratorial reasoning about Abe's purported links to the Unification Church. Uh, but Katie, I thought we could just generally talk a bit about uh, what Abe has meant uh, for, um, really, I mean, you know, we could go all the way back to his first prime ministerial term, which lasted just one year from 2006 and 2007. Abe is in many ways uh, fundamental to uh, many of the dynamics that we regularly discuss on this podcast. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly when I saw the news coming out uh, about certain initially the attack, and then then you know, we realized that, that Abe did not survive the attack. You know, my first thought was, I have not worked on the Asia Pacific in a time that Abe was not a monumental figure. Uh, I, I think certainly for the last decade, Abe has been kind of the, the central and the most prominent Japanese politician, certainly of his era, and, and pretty much of, of the last several decades at least um and and i think and, and he was prominent for a number of reasons but certainly for the topics that we cover on this podcast the most geopolitics his sort of position within the asia pacific and how he viewed japan's place in it and how he viewed japan's place changing within the asia pacific certainly underscored his importance um certainly the, the, the thing I think I've seen the most discussion about is sort of Abe as the father of the Quad, the father of this sort of Indo-Pacific concept. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about sort of Abe as as that central figure in the really a geopolitical re-understanding of, of the Pacific? Yeah, I think I think I think maybe it's fair to say that Abe has always been sort of a forward looking um Japanese politician and leader. I think he's uh, fundamentally thought about Japan's position uh, in the world in the 21st century amid a, a shifting region, a rising China. Um, when Abe first became prime minister in 2006, uh, he was the youngest prime minister in Japanese post-war history at the age of 52. Uh, and by the time he stepped down in 2020, he had become Japan's longest serving prime minister. And so I think recognizing those those sort of milestones and all that Abe accomplished for Japan, uh, he's going to become the second post-war prime minister after Shigeru Yoshida, um, the who really was the founder of much of Japan's post-war foreign policy and economic policy, to receive a state funeral in Japan, uh, which is really something that, uh, that I think showcases uh, the level to which he had he had risen. Um, the the Quad, the Indo-Pacific, uh, you know, all of these things that are talked about today. Uh, yeah, you're right, Katie. I mean, many of these ideas can be traced back to Abe's uh, first non-consecutive prime ministerial term, which was a short term uh, from September 2006 uh, to the next year, 2007. Uh, Abe stepped down ultimately amid poor health, and that was actually the period where Japan went into the revolving door era of, of prime ministers coming and going. Uh, and, and it was actually Abe who would come back in December 2012 to end that era and then hang on to power for uh, a period of about eight years, uh, during which he accomplished a, a tremendous amount for Japan's foreign security uh, and economic policy under under his Abenomics rubric. Um, just on the Indo-Pacific real quickly, I mean, uh, Abe, first of all, I think one of the things that was really um, 
not unique to Abe. I mean, his predecessors, including Prime Minister Mori, had sort of started this process. But Abe, Abe recognized India as an important partner for, for Japan, uh, and he actually went to uh, India uh, during his first prime ministerial term, and he he delivered a speech before the Indian Parliament, uh, and the title of that speech was "The Confluence of the Two Seas," um, the seas being the oceans, uh, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. And you see where I'm going with this. That speech was sort of, I think, the seed through which Japan's thinking about the Indo-Pacific region and the broader idea of an Indo-Pacific as as a geostrategic concept. I think I think began, uh, and it was also during Abe's first. Uh, prime ministerial term that the Quad in its first iteration, um, which included the same states, the U.S., Japan, India, and Australia, uh, began to formally emerge as a consultative group, uh, although it disbanded after uh, Chinese criticism at the time, only to reemerge in in uh, November 2017 in a working group um, meeting, also under Abe's prime ministerial term. So Abe was really instrumental in, in in promoting these dynamics. He oversaw Japan's first national security strategy. Uh, he oversaw the creation of, of the Ministry of Defense in Japan, which was created in 2007. Um, and uh, during his term uh, in, in 2015, uh, the LDP, the Liberal Democratic Party, Japan's ruling party through most of its post-war history, uh, saw through um, the the legislation in September 2015 uh, that effectively allowed Japan's military, the self-defense force, to participate in overseas conflicts, uh, overturning uh, the earlier policy which had only allowed the military to fight in, in self-defense. Uh, this was a result of the LDP deciding to reinterpret the language in Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution, uh, which is sort of the pacifist clause that that constrains a lot of um, what the Japanese military can do. And so that's just, you know, I think a small flavor of, of how Abe uh, had an effect on security policy. On on the economic piece, uh, I think, you know, Abe was fundamentally a uh, in favor of liberalization. He was a strong promoter of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, and, and even, I mean, after the United States exited uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership under the Trump administration, Abe sort of held his ground, including um, during his very first press conference with Donald Trump defending the TPP, uh, despite the fact that that would be perceived potentially negatively by the American president, who had just pulled out of the agreement a few weeks earlier. So I kind of put a lot out there, Katie, but, you know, we can we can dig into really anything and everything. And of course, that's just a small sliver uh, of what um, the former prime minister had accomplished. And of course, you know, I'd be remiss not to point out the the, the controversies and the difficulties that also colored Abe's uh, time in office, including a sharp deterioration in relations with uh, South Korea in particular in the uh, in the final years of his second term uh, and in December 2013, when the United States actually publicly, uh, in a very rare rebuke, actually publicly said that it was disappointed in Abe after he became only the second sitting Japanese prime minister uh, to visit uh, Yasukuni Shrine uh, in Tokyo, which commemorates uh, Japan's war dead, including uh, several uh, Class A war criminals uh, who were recognized by the International Military Tribunal for the Far East at the conclusion of the Second World War. So, Complex legacy, tremendous achievements, uh, no lack of controversy, but really, I think Abe was a towering figure uh, in many ways in the Indo-Pacific. Yeah, I mean that that's in incontrovertible, regardless of sort of one's opinion of, of Abe's uh, positions on some of those more touchy issues. Uh, and, I, and I think we'll see more conversation of the the controversies as, as sort of time moves on. You know, right after something tragic happens, uh, I think there's certainly a preference for talking about the positive legacies or sort of the monumental legacies of different figures. But but Abe definitely has um, some controversies, as you as you noted. Um, and also, I think, fits in an interesting space within Japanese domestic politics. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you, because we had talked before about this, I wanted to ask you about, you know, how, how is sort of the the aftermath of, of the, the assassination. So without Abe as this towering figure, what, where does that leave the LDP? So, you know, Abe was the leader of the largest faction within the LDP. Uh, current Prime Minister uh, Kishida Fumio is, is the leader of, I think, the fourth largest faction within mm -hmm. the LDP. So he's not, you know, he doesn't have sort of a controlling stake within within the party, um, but is, is seems to be very... Um, committed to carrying on Abe's legacy. That seems to be sort of what he said uh, in, the, in the aftermath of this event. So I am curious, sort of your view on, on Abe's position within domestic Japanese politics and, and where, where it goes from here. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a fascinating moment. Uh, you know, as 
a full disclosure, as someone who hasn't been to Japan since November 2019, I feel, you know, a little out of touch on some of the domestic political debates that are playing out. I mean, you know, just reading them from afar. But the narrative that I think is sort of building is that, uh, so first of all, in the aftermath of, of Abe's assassination, uh, the LDP um, received a, a, you know, a, a very good showing in the upper house elections. Uh, so for Kishida right now, there's sort of the stars have sort of aligned domestically, uh, politically, right? His 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 cabinet's approval ratings are reasonably high, hovering around 50 percent. Uh, Kishida, of course, um, won the lower house elections, uh, won the upper house election, and he has a um, a a pretty strong mandate right now. Uh, as as Japan is also uh, in in the process of revising um, its uh, national security strategy, putting out new national defense program guidelines. There's a lot of soul searching happening. Uh, you know, we of course talked on a recent episode about uh, Kishida's vision for Japan's defense policy as he sort of laid out in his uh, keynote address at the Shangri-La Dialogue. Um, and so all of this, I think, is, is going to be uh, something to watch uh, in the near future because uh, you're absolutely right that I think Abe's legacy, the things that Abe really wanted to see done in his lifetime, including uh, Japan's total normalization as a military power and 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 the formal modification of Japan's constitution, uh, those objectives now come within reach. Uh, I don't think Kishida is going to reach for those immediately in the short term, um, but I think uh, it will be uh, politically, I think, to his benefit uh, in in a way that you know I think uh, these dynamics are are playing out that uh, in a way that helps him consolidate power. Uh, I think there was some concern after uh, after Abe stepped down uh, and his chief cabinet secretary uh, Suga Yoshihide stepped up to the prime ministership that Japan might once again enter into this era of revolving door politics as the LDP sort of internal factional politics played out. Uh, but as you noted, uh, Abe, as the leader of the largest faction within the LDP, now leaves a power vacuum, uh, which may evaporate, may may work out to Kishida's advantage. Um, I frankly don't follow the internal factional politics of the LDP closely enough to really say with any authority where things might go, but I think the dynamics here uh, will ultimately be um, be interesting to watch. For uh, for Kishida, I think this is uh, really going to provide an opportunity uh, to sort of um, consolidate his own position within the party uh, and to and to lead the party and to carry out a lot of what Abe I think tried to do. Uh, what's interesting also is the you know I think Kishida, contrary to Abe, uh, is is perceived as as something more of a um, um, as somewhat more of a relative. You know, a liberal within the LDP, uh, in the sense that I think, um, you know, as a um, as a former uh, member from Hiroshima, Kishida has, I think, a, a a certainly a different view on nuclear matters when it comes to Abe. I think uh, one of Abe's most prominent moments uh, before his assassination, publicly on matters related to security, was when after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, he publicly mooted the idea of Japan having to consider ideas like nuclear sharing uh, with the United States, mm. like NATO allies do. So I think Kishida might have a different view on on some of those matters. Um, but I think uh, domestically, it, it it certainly opens up uh, a power vacuum uh, within the LDP. Yeah, and, and I, I just want to add that um, if my reading is correct, Kishida is not going to face sort of an election again for, for three years unless he, right. he calls an early election. So I think Kishida does have this this golden window of opportunity in which we're not yet in a revolving door of politicians. So he has sort of an opportunity to consolidate himself with, within the party and sort of figure out which pieces of Abe's legacy he maybe wants to actively try to pursue or in, in which ones he doesn't um, and sort of come into his own. Cause you know, Kishida was uh, the, I think he was foreign minister under Abe for, for yes. several years. And so his sort of is very much in, intricately linked to Abe and Abe's legacy, but obviously, as you, you noted, has sort of his own views on a number of the issues. The nuclear issue in particular is is one. Uh, and so I think it'll be interesting to watch how, how that factionalization shakes out. Um, as as sort of the party moves into the future w without Abe, um, mm. and I think maybe the next thing uh, sort of flows us out because we could probably talk about Abe for a very long time. I'm curious your view on how Abe sort of um, adjusted Japan's relationships with its neighbors. So the the Japan China relationship you mentioned previously, the Japan South Korea relationship. Um, how maybe we could talk about the Japan China relationship a little bit um, and how sort of Abe sort of uh, not to not to spoil it, but it got better and then it got worse and then it got better and then it got worse. Uh, and I, I think it's probably not in a great place at the moment. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, there were ebbs and flows. Uh, like, you're absolutely right. There was a period where uh, Japanese and Chinese officials had no high-level contact for, I think it was a period of two years. Uh, this was in my early days at The Diplomat, right after the Senkaku nationalization in September 2012, mm -hmm. all the way to, uh, to, I think, the end of 2014, uh, when this kind of drought lasted. And then things kind of improved. Uh, and then they got worse again. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that the trend line in Japanese security policy uh, was away from China decisively, especially under the Xi Jinping era, and especially as Abe sort of concluded his turn uh, when the U.S.-China relationship declined substantially. Um, Abe, I think, uh, ensured that Japan remained in lockstep with the United States. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, I think um, one of my sort of most memorable moments is when Abe had to rush to New York City in November 2016, uh, when Donald Trump unexpectedly won the election uh, during the campaign, uh, Japan, I think, had, like so many countries, unexpectedly um, or, you know, um, met with Hillary Clinton, but not with Donald Trump. So he sort of went to Trump Tower with a golden golf club to sort of ensure that the next phase of the U.S.-Japan alliance would hopefully start off on a good foot. And of course, things got rocky there. Uh, but anyways, I'm kind of digressing by talking more about the U.S.-Japan alliance with China. Uh, you know, I mean, that's uh, the other thing I'd point out is that um, this was the period Abe's uh, second term, uh, the eight year term was when Japan successively started passing um, defense budgets that were, uh, you know, larger than the last and, and the greatest in Japan's post-war history, showing, I think, the, the realignment. A lot of this was framed, of course, in terms of North Korea as well, which significantly expanded uh, the threat from its missile programs during Abe's um, a second term. Um, but the the sort of white papers that came out of Japan uh, very clearly described, I think, a serious concern about China and the East China Sea, the South China Sea, the Taiwan Strait. Uh, Taiwan, I mean, in particular, I think, was an era, um, area where Abe had a uh, had a tremendous difference. I think just looking at the reactions from Taipei after Abe's assassination really, uh, really underscores that. Uh, so yeah, I think I, I think overall the trend line, uh, you know, was that Abe took Japan in a direction. Uh, with um, focusing on greater self-sufficiency uh, in its national defense, making sure that the alliance with the United States remained ironclad, um, but broadly, I think, anticipating a, uh, a future that would be more confrontational uh, with China, even as there were those brief periods of, um, of cooperative uh, rapprochement with Beijing. Yeah, and I think that certainly underscores, in the, the def as you pointed out, the defense budgets uh, mm -hmm. that grew during Abe's tenure and and kind of, you know, if we go all the way back to 20, 2012, when Abe came into office for that second stint, that longer stint as prime minister, I think there was a lot of discussion about the remilitarization of Japan and, and what he wanted to do with the constitution, which in the context of Japan is sort of shocking change, but in the context of how other countries have militaries and, and operate is maybe not as shocking. And so sort of bringing Japan um, back to quote unquote normal country uh, security kinds of policies, you know, that was sort of a thing that we all that people talked about as sort of shocking. Um, I think certainly now, given North Korea's continued pursuit of nuclear weapons, um, China's activities, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, a, a more securitized Japan is not necessarily viewed as as a huge threat. I think certainly. South Korea might have a different opinion of that, um, and China has a different opinion of that. But but in a global context, um, it certainly seemed, as you said at the top, uh, you know, Abe's more forward-looking policies have kind of come into their own, uh, and I think will continue to. Uh... Yeah. Um, so, Katie, I guess before we wrap up today. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, our sponsor for today's episode, uh, Quarterly Essay. Quarterly Essay is Australia's leading journal of politics, culture, and debate. Their latest issue, Sleepwalk to War, Australia's Unthinking Alliance with America by Hugh White, explores Australia's fateful choice to back America to the hilt and oppose China. White assesses America's credibility and commitment by examining AUKUS, the Quad, Trump, and Biden. He discusses what the Ukraine conflict tells us about the future and argues that the U.S. can neither contain China nor win a war over Taiwan. For over 20 years, Quarterly Essay has been at the forefront of political discussion, publishing award-winning essays from outstanding writers, journalists, and commentators. Use promo code DIPLOMAT to take 20% off an ebook or print copy of this original essay by Australia's leading strategic thinker. Read more at quarterlyessay.com.au. So, Katie, I think uh, we'll leave it there for today, uh, even though I agree with you that we could talk about Abe's legacy for considerably longer. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts? Uh, no, but I, I look forward to uh, our next episode. Uh, 
I will be back in the D.C. area for it. Absolutely. Well, to all of our listeners, thanks for tuning in as always. Make sure you subscribe so you can keep up with future episodes. And if you've been a subscriber for a while, but you haven't yet left us a review, please do that. We really uh, do appreciate that. And it helps us out quite a bit. And as always, if you have suggestions for either me or Katie about what we could cover on future episodes, uh, topics that you haven't heard on the podcast for a while that you'd like us to get back to, please drop us a note. We're very happy to uh, take that feedback. So thanks a lot for listening. And we'll be back soon with more.